The agenda this week caught up on plans to redevelop the iconic Ontario Place, assessed a tough year for K-12 education in the province, and heard from child welfare advocate Cindy Blackstock on why Canadians need to face this country's history with Indigenous residential schools. The Agenda's Week in Review begins touring the province ahead of a staycation summer. Heather, going to follow up with you. How difficult is it to, to plan family trips where the kids can get some educational benefit out of it, but it doesn't feel pedagogical, if you know what I mean? Yeah, I actually think it's quite easy. We just have to do a little bit of extra legwork at the beginning, right? Researching your site and making sure that where you're going, you're actually asking the questions that will uh, help set the stage for it to be a little different than usual. So look for those tours that are a little offbeat, right? Maybe not the uh, typical historical tour and see if you can get behind the scenes a little bit to get some alternate perspectives. But there's a ton of stuff out there for sure. Okay, your favorite, I guess, place in the province of Ontario, well known for its history that you like to go to. What is it? Well, well known I would go with Kingston, um, as Raywat did, but I think the one that we need to know better is Chatham-Kent. So Chatham-Kent is actually best known as being the terminus of the Underground Railroad here in Canada, or one of them. And so there is a ton of history right there that talks about that and talks about Canada's role in maybe not being as good as it should have been at that time and sort of not being the hero that it's sometimes painted as. The Buxton School, which is on the Buxton his historical site you're looking at there, is actually a school that was all black and formed because the uh, local white parents didn't want their kids going to school with black children. In the end, the school became, um, was, uh, sorry, I've lost the word, but that brought everyone together because the white parents actually wanted their kids to go to the better school. Isn't that interesting? And how far back does that school go? I believe it's back to the 1800s. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. Terrific. Okay. Chatham Kent, that's a great choice. Raywat, your, your pick for a place that's just oozing history in the province. I have a strange choice. That's Ajax, Ontario. And the reason for that, it's not named after the character in Homer. It's named after the HMX uh, Ajax, which is one of three ships involved in a battle in World War II against uh, a Nazi ship called the uh, the Graf Spree, I think. And this was something called the Battle of the River Plate, the first naval battle of World War II. It was a big deal back then. It made all the news because it was the first naval battle. And the town is named after one of the ships of the battle. And the street names of that town are all people who were involved in that battle, including the captain of the German Nazi ship, Hans Langdorf. And I think for the longest time, it's the only city in the Western world with the street named after a Nazi, because supposedly he behaved himself quite honorably uh, in accordance with the Hague Convention. I think, though, that there's a movement uh, to rename that street, unless it's already been happening. Um, but it's a, it's a touch of World War II history that we're not often aware of right here in the, in the heart of Ontario. That is fascinating. I didn't know that. And of course, um, Kitchener used to be Berlin, and the Berlin name did not survive, but apparently this street name did. That's kind of cool. Okay. Uh, Aaron, pick up the uh, cudgel, if you would, and tell us your favorite historic place to go. I have to go with my hometown, Ottawa. I think uh, for Canadian history especially, we've got everything here. Um, the last uh, person to die of capital punishment in Canada is here, so you can take the haunted walk. Of course, this was the person who many say was wrongly convicted of assassinating Darcy McGee, a father of Confederation, and so his ghost haunts the Byward Market today. Um, and if you do come down here, of course, you see the Parliament buildings and all of that and Indigenous uh, sites, but you definitely have to go to the Mackenzie King estate. Uh, Ray Watt mentioned the war, and we hear about how our Prime Minister at that time, Mackenzie King, um, it, they take you on a haunted walk there too, and it's just fabulous uh, to learn about Canadian history about a prime minister who, during the war, was using psychics and mediums to give him advice on what decisions to make. And they're very open about it. And um, and and also his relationship with his his pets. He believed his dog, there were physically two dogs, but with one name, Pat, because the dog was reincarnated. And my favorite part was when, well, they have the ruins, of course. They took Canadian ruins and put them on his estate. But my favorite part was when they told us that Mackenzie King, when he died, wanted to be buried with Pat, between Pat's two bodies, his dog, his dogs. And this actually went to Westminster because people here felt, well, he should be buried where he wants to be buried. But they also said, 
it would be it would be humiliating to Canada to have a prime minister buried with dogs, and so it actually went to Westminster and it was ruled that he could not be buried with uh, with Pat. Well, that explains why, because he's buried 20 minutes from this studio, at Mount Pleasant Cemetery, and I I go, I go visit him all the time actually, and it explains why his gravesite says, "Here lies William Lyon Mackenzie King," and there's no reference to Pat. I guess Pat didn't make the cut. No, Pat's at the Mackenzie King estate, and they actually have a cafe there called Cafe Pat, where you can go and, and pay your respects. <laughs> to Pat. To That's Pat. great. And there's, okay. two tomb, there's one tombstone and two dogs, of course, <laughs> and it's just Pat singular. The stuff we're learning tonight. This is terrific. Okay, David, let's just go back to a bit of the beginning of this. Why is the provincial government yeah. determined in the first place to redevelop Ontario Place? Well, it was a bit of a mystery as to why all of a sudden Doug Ford had a real desire to redo it, although it, you know, the, the park was essentially fallow and unused, so it makes sense they would at some point. But it was at the opening of the X a few years ago that a TV cameraman just sort of said to him, like, are you going to redevelop Ontario Place? And he said, yeah. And then at the announcement, all of a sudden, he said, and we're going to redo, redo Ontario Place. And then since then... You know, there's been a big push with, uh, as you mentioned, proposals coming from all over the world on how to redo it. I mean, we know that Doug Ford has an interest in the waterfront. When he was at uh, the city of Toronto as a city councillor and right-hand man to his brother Rob, who was mayor, people will recall that he essentially tried to engineer a takeover of the city's waterfront plans and seize it from Waterfront Toronto, which is an agency that has city, provincial, and federal that didn't fly. So I, I think we all expected at some point he would, you know, want to put his stamp on Ontario Place, which is provincially owned property. Um, but how he went about it, I think, was different than a lot of the people at the city expected. Well, let's just remind everybody how we got here. We've got a half century of history to look back at. And uh, let me just take a moment here to go through it, because it was, in fact, back on May 22nd, 1971, that Ontario Place opened to the public Followed by, you may remember this, the Children's Village the next year. John Robarts was the premier who wanted kids in Toronto to have a place to play in the summer. So he got Ontario Place started. Bill Davis was the premier who cut the ribbon on the place 50 years ago. In 1992, let's fast forward. It was redefined as a water amusement park. In 1994, it's open-air theater, The Forum. Boy, that place was great. But it was replaced by the Molson Amphitheater. In 2002, the Children's Village was demolished. In 2012, Ontario Place was shuttered by the then government of Premier Dalton McGuinty. In 2014, the province recognized Ontario Place as a heritage place. In 2019, the province abandoned its potential plan to put a casino on the grounds of Ontario Place. And last year, Ontario Place was added to the World Monuments Watch List. Okay, let's pick up the story there. Aziza, the World Monuments Watch List, what is that? Well, um, it is, you know, kind of a list that's uh, been uh, put together by an uh, NGO based in New York and having arms of, of all over the world called the uh, World Monuments Fund. And that this side of every year to name the most important buildings in the world that are of, of at risk, so the heritage buildings. And uh, Ontario Place has been named, um, uh, you know, in 2020, at the same time as Easter Island, for example, or the Cathedral of, of, of Notre Dame. So that speaks a lot of its importance as um, heritage uh, on the world stage. In your view, what makes Ontario Place worthy of being on that list? Well, there are so many things, but one thing for sure, it's its unique combination of landscape. And so it's a three artificial islands that were built on Lake Ontario that are uh, interconnected by a series of different parks and also different uh, bridges that connect a series of landmark uh, buildings, including the famous City Sphere that hosted the first uh, IMAX theater in the world, five floating pods, uh, the uh, children's village, the villages. So it's simply a stunning piece uh, of what we call in the field of architecture, it's a mega structure. So it's a structure that attempts to integrate architecture and landscape and infrastructure together. And there are very few of them in the world that were built uh, on the water. So if Toronto holds one, one of these very few modern masterpieces, why would they want to tamper with it? 
All right, one more follow-up, Aziza. It, if it enjoys heritage place protection, is it not safe? Uh, it's not actually um, 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 protected. It was indeed put on the uh, list of heritage by the province in 2014, but very conveniently, it was removed from that list right before uh, the, um, you know, kind of the call for development. Now, if it is on the list of the World Monuments Fund, it has an international recognition, but this recognition, unfortunately, today does not seem to be uh, understood by the province. You got a guess about what percentage of the curriculum you just didn't get to this year? <laughs> uh, I would say probably about, I probably had to put aside about a quarter of the curriculum, to be honest. Um, I, I wanted to make sure that they learned well the content that they did. Um, and because of that, I added, put aside a, a quarter, uh, uh, approximately the content. Hmm. Jay, how does that compare to your experience? I would have to agree. That's a pretty safe answer. Uh, a quarter would probably be left out. However, I would say I touched on as much as I could. I focused on student interest and student voice as much as possible. Also focused on much of what was happening in and around the world. Um, and that, I think, drove my class, my class, my teaching, and my connections to the curriculum this year. All right, let's get some feedback from the two post-secondary people now. Prachi, you've heard what these two educators have to say. What's your initial reaction to what you've heard? Well, I think, firstly, teachers are the stars of this year. Um, thank you so much for your service. And I, I'm well aware of all of the, um, the issues, the, the, the issues that um, households have been facing, that students have been facing, that teachers have been facing. And all of this, in my mind, really comes down to insufficient planning. Um, it comes down to insufficient planning from the provincial level. And given um, that many of us were warning, um, raising serious concerns, um, you know, since I would say last, at least since last summer, but I had started working on this since last March, um, it's really somewhat inexcusable that we are here in Ontario in a high resource context and we've suffered the longest school closures in Canada. And actually, we've suffered the longest in North America and Europe, if you look at the average uh, globally. So that's quite uh, shocking. I think um, our system and, you know, in terms of systems planning was just not firstly prepared. And secondly, um, when there were um, issues in terms of thinking about what we should be doing regarding the exigencies of this year. That just wasn't clear. And so we're in a situation where educators, school boards, schools did really the best they could within circumstances that were unprecedented. And if we look at other um, contexts, are, we're actually much worse than other contexts in the way that we dealt with education in this province. All right, much to follow up on there, and we will. Kelly, let me get your initial reaction, first of all, though, to what you heard from our two educators. Well, I think that they talked about some of the most important uh, challenges that face teachers and the biggest uh, reward and emotionally compelling part, which is the experience of students. Um, it makes sense that teachers have had to adapt, and I agree with Prachi that the level of adaptation of the teaching workforce in Ontario is extraordinary, and, and many other places as well. Um, so the capacity to have to throw out your existing engaged pedagogy, imagine for very young children, if you've run a play-based classroom with lots of, st of stations, and all of a sudden you are uh, delivering through sort of this direct two-way transmission, staring up at a screen full of cameras off, um, students trying to engage socially, knowing the importance of relationships, knowing the importance of in-depth engaged learning, more than just one specific chunk of knowledge. Um, I think that's been tremendous. And then doing it in the context of constant turnarounds, um, a policy framework, uh, particularly introducing this concept of parental choice that only happened in Alberta and Ontario, 
um, which segregated and resplit classes and caused us to, um, you know, have much more churn and disruption than other places. Um, there have been numerous specific uh, problems with the way in which education policy unrolled in Ontario this year. Uh, the classic line of Ontario education policy comes back from Mike Harris. Uh, John Snowblin, the then education minister, said, let's create a crisis in education. <laughs> it wasn't good. Uh, and what we have here is a crisis from the outside and a government that either hasn't coped with it or has been trying to take advantage of it for ideological reasons. The last residential school closed in 1996. So there are people around today who would have stopped those institutions. And um, they ought, to the degree possible, they ought to be held responsible. But what we also need to do is we need to find out, even for those perpetrators that have passed on, what did they do? And more importantly, what happened to the kids that they victimized? So that we can set a true telling of history so that we can learn from it and, and come closer to realizing the values of the country and get rid of these chasms because colonialism did two things. One is, of course, all these horrendous injustices and deaths of these children and that continue in some form today. And then on the other side was this complete erasure of history by the Canadian government to keep Canadians in the dark. Because the view was, if Canadians actually understood what was happening to these kids, they would be like Blake and they would be like Bryce and they'd be outraged and they'd be speaking and demanding change. And the government did not want that to happen. So the non-Indigenous population was also victimized by this colonialism because it was robbed of its opportunity to do better. I, I should ask you a bit of a strange question here, which is, are you a lawyer? No. <laughs> I, I'm a social worker, but... Um, I, as you know, Stephen, I've for 14 and a half years been litigating against Canada. Well, that's why I asked. Equitable services today. That's so why I, I asked. I got a law degree to learn how to do that better. Ah. Um, so yeah, I have a law degree, but I'm not a lawyer. Okay. Because uh, I mean, I, I knew you're a PhD in social work, but of course I, and so many others always associate you with the work that you're doing in the courts. So let's yeah. go there. What are you working on now? Well, um, what a lot of folks don't know is remember those healthcare care uh, inequities that Dr. Bryce pointed to linking to the deaths? Well, they, they were never fixed. The federal government funds First Nations public services and does so at far lesser levels than everyone else. That's why we got things like no water on some First Nations reserves. Um, and in 2000, when I was fresh on the national scene, I bounced on there and I thought, you know, we're going to document these inequalities with the federal government. We're going to cost out solutions and we're going to show them how they're creating harms to these children, even to harms where they were driving them into foster care because families didn't have the help they needed to recover from the trauma of residential schools at greater numbers than the residential schools. So we did all that. And the government welcomed the report, said they'd review it, and then they did nothing. I got sucked in a second time and we did another report, same result. So in 20, 2007, we filed a human rights complaint along with the Assembly of First Nations against Canada, alleging that what they were doing was racially discriminatory. Canada fought that case tooth and nail all the way. And then finally in 2016, we got the decision that substantiated the discrimination and ordered Canada to stop. The, the tribunal found that not only was Canada's discrimination pushing kids unnecessarily into foster care, it was resulting in serious harms and even the deaths of some children. Canada agreed with the decision, and then they did exactly what they did with those reports. They ignored it. So now, fast forward past the TRC, where equity and child welfare and something called Jordan's Principle, which is to ensure equitable public services are given to First Nations kids, those are the top calls to action. Fast forward to now, we've had 19 non-compliance and procedural orders against the feds. And just last a uh, couple of weeks ago, we were in federal court uh, where they were trying to overturn some of the tribunal's orders to get them closer to uh, justice. So the feds continue to fight tooth and nail against this generation of kids. I'd be very interested in your theory as to why you think that's happening, given that the current prime minister says Reconciliation with Indigenous communities is his top agenda. Yeah, I don't get it. And I also didn't get it like uh, 
the week before we were in the federal court hearings, the prime minister was on the floor of parliament saying he was not fighting indigenous children in court. And I was thinking, well, then why are we going to court next week? And the public can just tune in and watch this. It's almost like they're in an alternate kind of QAnon reality sometimes. <laughs> what gives me some hope is that the Canadian public seems to be far out in front of the federal government on this one. Like the federal government is really still operating from a deeply colonial place. In fact, Stephen, we don't have to look far to look at that. We can look at the contemporary inequalities and the non-compliance with the law, but we can also look at that racist Indian Act that was used to push kids into residential schools. It's still on the books, despite there being a plan to get rid of it uh, released in 1996. So I, 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 I think it's that colonialism that just pervades their minds. They just can't reconcile the fact that they themselves are doing the injustice. They'd rather look at it in the past so that they don't have to really do anything other than apologize and send hopes and prayers. That's just some of what we covered this week on the agenda. For more, including the full conversations, you can visit our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.